SEP Fanfic Readings presents Measure of a Man by In a Daze 22. Chapter 36 Shadows November 17, 2011. Like celestial bodies, Hermione and Draco were inextricably linked. The olive tree was in their line of sight as they laid together in the charmed hammock. Limbs entwined, they simply existed in some stolen slice of time and space. The stillness was settling, peaceful, and she finally understood an undisputable truth. Love was a force greater than gravity. But rather than pulling her down, it left her weightless, breathless. They floated in a sea of contentment, drifted through a hazy fog of kisses and smiles, soft caresses and murmured words. The afterglow was a reprieve from the earlier strife, and a break before the work ahead. The sun crept higher above the horizon. Draco's yawns became more frequent, his eyes grew heavier, and his words stretched slower until they almost slurred. Though Hermione urged him otherwise, he wouldn't sleep. Not yet. He merely relaxed with his eyes shut and a hand in her messy curls, the other twined in hers while his thumb swept over her knuckles. Soon the shade provided by the olive tree retreated. Hiding their faces in each other's wasn't enough to protect them from the direct rays of light. Let's go inside. The trek was quick, and the cold air warred with the warmth of their hazy adoration. Hermione took care of the chicks, refilling their water and feed, while Draco made her a simple breakfast of eggs with toast and jam. They ate at the table in the conservatory, with her leg draped over his, tuned to the sound of the happy chirping and the view of the world coming to life. The sun rose steadily on. No need for conversation. Looks and smiles between bites were enough. His hand, like him, was no longer a phantom, but a tangible presence on her leg. Did you like the tea blend I left you? I didn't try it. Hermione swept her thumb over his signet ring, tracing the symbol of his lineage. Her eyes lifted to find Draco staring boldly, with a faint color in his cheeks. "'Will you make me another? I'll make yours. I remember how. "'Or I can make both, and you can watch.' "'Sitting on the island, her legs dangled as she counted each time gray eyes wandered to her "'in the nine minutes it took him to prepare their cups. "'And though he placed hers on the countertop first, "'Hermione waited until he was standing between her parted legs with his own tea before reaching for hers. "'It was a rose-lavender-black tea blend she hadn't tried before.' Aromatic and floral, it was smoother and lighter than her usual blend, and sweetened with a touch of honey. Hermione drank with her eyes trained on him, privately wondering what prompted the choice, and how he knew she'd enjoy it when it wasn't her usual preference. She finished not long after Draco, and he placed their empty teacups in the sink before resting his hands on either side of her on the counter. "'You'll make me tea every day, won't you?' She brought her hand to his jaw. "'feeling the sharp angles dusted with stubble she couldn't see. "'Yes.' "'He dipped his head lower, "'closing a fraction of the space between them. "'Even when I'm angry at you. "'Make sure it's extra hot, then.' "'Suspended in the moment of levity, "'they smiled at each other, "'but hers faded when she noticed creases of exhaustion around his eyes. "'You didn't sleep.' "'No, but I will.' "'Their noses brushed, and he kissed her quickly.' I'll finish up here, call to check on Scorpius, and take a shower. Okay. There should be a spare towel and a face cloth in the bathroom already. I'll go and check on the chickens in the coop outside, water the plants, and make sure the things I'm drying for Scorpius's gift will be ready by Christmas. Hermione took her time with her tasks, even letting the chickens feed directly from her hand. It wasn't long before they ignored her to run around with each other, and she continued on. The conservatory plants were easy to water, but the task was interrupted by a call from her dad checking in after receiving no answer at the Malfoy house. The last time he'd called, she was too distracted to talk. Unfortunately, the same was true this time, too. When she heard the shower start, Hermione promised to ring back and continued completing her tasks. At least, she would have, had she not been staring at the rose trellises Neville wanted to move into the greenhouse, and she left her wand behind and went upstairs. Hermione stood outside the bathroom door, worrying her lip with her teeth and poised to knock. 
but she didn't let herself overthink it. Slipping into the bathroom, she stripped away her clothing, piece by piece, until she was at the shower door, with only a clean cloth in hand. "'Are you going to stand there all morning?' Draco's drawl accompanied the sound of falling water. No, she wasn't. Steam greeted her before the sight of a wet Draco holding a soaped-up cloth stole her attention. Hermione closed the door and joined him under the spray of scalding water. Closing her eyes and tilting her head back, she let herself enjoy the cleansing burn, and the newness of the casual intimacy found with him. How was Scorpius? Good. He handed her the soap. Daphne's in-laws are visiting. Scorpius is watching rugby highlights with Dean and his father before the game starts. They're teaching him. Hermione lathered the face cloth. Is he squinting? Surprisingly, no. But apparently he has an interest in that and football. She knew exactly how focused he was when intrigued by something new. Are you thinking of letting him play? If he's still interested when he's old enough. And that was the end of the conversation. They showered together, taking their time, washing each other, touching, caressing, and taking turns rinsing off. It smelled like flowers in the rain. Hermione could almost taste it when she placed a kiss on the piece of his heart etched on his skin for her. Draco never took his hands off of her. Perhaps one day Hermione wouldn't be surprised that being naked with him felt natural, and showering together was as easy as matching his breath at night, but today wasn't that day. His acceptance came exactly the way she imagined it would, with tenderness and restraint, as if fearing she'd slip out of his fingers. At least, that was how it started. Then he grew bold. Draco felt good. He felt right. Like magic. Like everything. The good, bad, and in-between culminated in this one act. Her senses were on fire. Hermione wanted to think that the changes between them didn't make this feel different. But it did. It did. A few failed attempts and the lack of desire to test fate against stability brought them out of the shower. A quick-drying charm later, and they were falling into the bed, then into each other. Draco's pace was frenetic, kisses portent, touch reverent. There was a sense of belonging, not just to the moment, but to each other. Lost in a time all their own, pleasure was found in more than just the physicality of the act understanding, exploration, intimacy. A tentative balance was sought and found, give and take, ebb and flow, over her own pounding heart and stuttered breaths through the hazy, rapid climb to her destination. Hermione heard him breathe unintelligible words into her skin. The stream of syllables didn't make any sense, but they didn't have to. She understood, offering words of her own into his damp hair. I love you. A word made her fly, fall, and float all at once. Hermione. Neither moved as they bathed in the afterglow. She didn't want to. She wanted to feel him like this, growing softer inside of her after they both recovered in each other's arms. Hermione had waited weeks for this, and she wanted to savor it, savor him, while all her emotions were locking into place. She silently identified the differences between how this felt when love was a new realization versus now as an expression. Draco obliged her unspoken request by fully resting against her, rocking them both slowly, and letting the pleasure linger while she scraped her fingers through the back of his hair. "'I think we need another shower,' Draco said a few minutes later, drawing her into a kiss that only paused long enough for them to return to the shower and back to the bed, where they picked up where they left off. Still naked and talking about nothing and everything, they filled the silence between them with kisses. You looked at my employment contract in June. About the time I was forced to admit a few things to myself. Draco shook his head. Denial has an expiration date. I know that all too well. Hmm. Draco touched the end of a damp curl. I know you want to know when. I'm sure you're trying to figure out the exact day and time, but I meant what I said before. I can't give you that. You just were, are, and will be. Hermione shifted closer. I'm realizing that in some cases the details don't matter as much as the end result. 
Draco's touch was as quiet as he could be. My mother told me you'd quit, but she wouldn't go into detail. Then I saw your note, not the blueprint, and I thought, I'd been trying to talk to you for days, but everything got in the way. Hermione rested a hand on the center of his chest. His heartbeat was steady under her palm. I don't want to talk about that now. I just... She stopped just before their lips touched. Let's just enjoy this moment. Finally. His deep, aching kisses left her gasping for more. She relished the way their hands roamed freely as past tension continued dissolving into ash. And there was nothing. They slept the sleep of the exhausted, unnaturally deep. Hermione woke during her body's intermittent attempts to rouse her with thoughts and tasks, but rest was inescapable in Draco's warm presence. Sunset was underway when Hermione finally stirred, and she took her time drinking in the sight of Draco sleeping next to her. Relaxed and boneless, breathing deeply, hair askance. It wasn't the first time she'd witnessed him like this, and noted how young he looked without the hard lines and tension he carried each and every day. It was a similar thought that came to mind when he smiled. Reluctant to answer her body's call, she did so anyway, but only after watching Draco sleep a little longer. Pleasantly sore, Hermione wrapped herself in a bathrobe, stretched, smiled, and looked at her reflection in the mirror. Nothing was different, yet everything was. It felt like peace. At least this gray square in the center of her puzzle felt solved. Hermione took a deep breath and left, fully prepared to slide back into bed, but when she opened the bathroom door, she found Draco awake. She sat next to him on the edge of the bed, and watched him search the pockets of his discarded trousers before pulling out something very small. His wand reversed the shrinking charm. Ha! Fresh clothes. Always prepared. Plans? I thought we'd take Scorpius to dinner and talk to him. Draco looked at her through the mirror. You should get dressed. By the time Hermione wandered back into the bathroom, dressed casually in dark jeans, a black jumper, a gray scarf and boots, Draco was frowning at his reflection. His hair was parted, but not quite in the his preferred style. She bit her lip, noting his look for the night. Black trousers, white shirt, black tie, gray vest. They matched. Well, almost. Didn't you have anything casual? Draco glanced at her reflection. This is casual. Hermione laughed and slid up next to him. Her hair was a bit of a disaster, but she managed to secure it in a curly bun with only moderate discomfort. Narcissa would fuss about tangles, but today it would do. Minutes later, they were standing in the flue in Daphne's living room, where they happened upon an interesting sight. Scorpius was lying on what looked like every blanket they owned in the middle of the living room, hair in disarray, and face partially buried in Cheddar's fur. His arm was around Halia, who was curled into his side with a dummy in her mouth. All three of them were asleep. Cheddar woke when the fireplace burst to life, but didn't move from his spot, not even when they stepped fully into the living room. It smelled wonderful. Hi. Hermione kept her voice low, trying not to disturb the sleeping cousins. We're just coming to pick up Scorpius. Come in, Daphne greeted them by waving them into the kitchen to join her and Dean's mother. They've been asleep for at least half an hour. Sweet dears. Dean's mother smiled. It was friendly, soothing. Though she barely crested Daphne's shoulder, Hermione couldn't help but see the resemblance. Not just with Dean, but also in Halia. We've taken at least a hundred photos. Mom was showing me how to make her Irish beef and Guinness stew. Smells wonderful, Hermione said once she and Draco were standing on the other side of the small island. Daphne pointedly looked at their joined hands. I take it everything's been resolved? Dean's mother's face lit up. Are these the... Mm-hmm, Daphne hummed. Congratulations! Draco's glare turned sharp on Daphne, but Hermione nudged his arm. Hard. We're just here to pick up Scorpius. Come back tomorrow. Daphne waved her hand. We're going to look at pictures tonight, and... Her smile turned a little sad, and Dean's mother was right there, wrapping an arm around her. She leaned into the embrace. Thanks, Mum. Any time, love. She turned to them. Now, keep stirring. 
Daphne did, with a steady hand on her back. She looked up at them. "'I mean it. Go. Enjoy your first night together. You can come get him tomorrow afternoon.' After she and Draco exchanged looks, Hermione offered a tiny shrug. They hadn't made plans beyond dinner and telling Scorpius. Now they had a free night. In the end, he decided on dinner. Instead of by car, they took the flu to the leaky cauldron and made the walk to a nearby steakhouse. Despite being reservation only in a crowded night, after a few words with the maitre d' out of Hermione's earshot, they were led to a cozy table off to the side and dined on an elaborate spread of Argentinian beef. Hermione's only regret was her inability to try all the suggested wines. "'Which would you choose?' Draco asked while she perused the wine menu. "'I'd let you choose.' Draco's response was a raised eyebrow. "'Oh?' "'Not because I can't decide. I'm only curious to see what you would choose and why. I'm fairly certain it would be something I'd never consider for myself. I can't drink right now anyway, so the point is moot. "'How long before you're weaned off?' A couple of weeks. Susan's monitoring me for nerve pain. They continued the silent agreement to talk about anything and everything except what they needed to. Hermione talked about the greenhouse expansion while Draco nodded along. He obviously knew everything she'd learned, but listened anyway with a slight curve to his lips. And when it was his turn, he asked two questions. Will you attend Blaise and Padma's wedding as my date? Do you want to go somewhere else for dessert? Hermione said yes to both, but smirked internally because after walking to a different restaurant that served lemon tarts, Draco ate more than his share. She didn't mind, but she was curious. Are they better than mine? I'm smart enough not to answer that. Hermione laughed. Bundled in coats, the slow walk back to the leaky cauldron was tolerable with warming charms and Draco's gloved hand in hers. Companionable silence was disrupted when he stopped just before the entrance to Diagon Alley. Something caught her eye in the darkness. Something. I want to show you something. Hermione's curious frown turned into a smile. Sure. He cast charms to disguise their appearances and led the way. Hermione followed through the rolled-away bricks and into the cobblestone wizarding alley a step behind. Activity was winding down as the temperature began to drop for the night. Still, witches and wizards were out and about, All the shops were open, and there were vendors selling trinkets and merchandise to passers. People looked, and Hermione had a brief worry that the charm hadn't held, but it wasn't until she noticed where they were standing that she realized it wasn't them that had drawn attention. It was what they were standing in front of. The eyesore. The burnt-out husk of the apothecary. Draco took a step towards the entrance. Wait, she grabbed his arm. Won't that be trespassing? He looked over his shoulder and a new smile lit his face, one that was hard to describe. Draco extended his hand. I can't trespass somewhere I own. Own? The word repeated in her head as they crossed the threshold of destruction. Darkness shadowed every crevice until Draco used his wand to turn on the lights, and surprisingly enough, they worked. The apothecary was in ruins, indicative of the fight before the still-missing potions master was unwillingly taken. It smelled like soot and something wet. Not an overall pleasant combination, but she'd smelt worse. The stairs leading to the quarters caught her eye first. They were unstable at best. Scorched walls with drag marks on the floor. Burnt and half-melted shelves. Every surface was covered with glass shards, wood chips, or spilled potions that magic would never allow to dry. Glass crunched beneath their shoes as she continued inward but the growing list of problems and concerns Hermione noted faded when she stopped and actually looked at Draco. He was walking around, hands behind his back, eyes taking in the same sight. But rather than the list of issues and reasons this was a bad idea weighing him down, his face was alight. He saw something she couldn't in the charred ruins. Potential. Why this place? Call it an impulse purchase I haven't been able to put time towards, not even to hire a magical sanitation company to clear everything. Draco looked around again. When everything settles, I'll figure it out. You already know or you wouldn't have purchased it. And the curious way he looked at her made Hermione recall a similar instance when he'd asked the same question. I'm listening. Fine. Draco looked as though he was speaking on a subject he hadn't quite found the words to describe out loud. I'm not interested in restoring it. 
I'd like to clear everything and redesign the layout to add a second floor. All the products will be made by hand. I'll have the basics, naturally, but I'll focus on more rare but necessary potions that are expensive. Once I get the business running, Theo wants to contract me for St. Mungo's. A quarter of the profits will go towards additional funding for studies on Astoria's blood curse, and another quarter will go to Charles' research into my mother's disease and the research for the cure. My research? Draco did a double-take. What? I... You don't know. Hermione pushed her hands into her pockets for a moment. I quit your mother's care not only because of you and a much-needed medical sabbatical, but also to go back to Healer Academy to study magical neurological diseases and disorders. When I finish and complete my apprenticeship, I'll head the research team into Narcissa's disease and oversee the experimentation aspect. There might not be a lot of time for Narcissa, but I want to find a... He took six steps and swept her into a kiss that left her breathless. You can use my garden to grow ingredients. The suggestion was out before she could stop herself, but once she said it aloud, it felt right. We have the space. Draco kept staring at her, which had the power to make her keep talking. I'm sure eventually we'll need more help, but... Is this a business proposition? No, but the garden will be part of your business. It's as much yours as it is mine with everything you've brought. All you'll need is someone to help manage this. I have zero interest in running this business. Once I finish with the task force, I plan to spend more time with Scorpius, brewing mainly while he's in school. However, I do have someone in mind to run the apothecary. Draco chuckled. If I can get him to leave California. Who? Greg. What? That was the last name Hermione expected to hear. Goyle? He works in procurement. His wife's family runs a company in the States. They have a partnership with Blaze and Daphne's company. They're odd like Lovegood, heavily focused on ethically sourced products and cruelty-free procurement, which is a growing trend. Draco touched the end of her scarf. They've been Daphne's source for the rare wolfsbane potion ingredients, as well as the reason you have a supply of dried kava. Hermione was so stunned she could barely comprehend what he'd said. I didn't even know you were still friends. You never talk about him. He's never come up. But I suppose there are still things you'll learn about me in time. And vice versa. Draco wasn't wrong. But, to answer your question, yes, we're all still friends. I haven't seen Greg since the story is funeral, but we write often. He and his wife are responsible for a quarter of the toys Scorpius doesn't play with. Something they both chuckled at. He'll be at Blaze's second ceremony in February. Quiet curiosity made Hermione excited for the reintroduction. Apparently, Greg wants to work in a similar business, which is why I suggested that he work with me. But he's used to the weather there and hates the rain. The only things in my favor are his wife's preference for Hogwarts over Ilvermorny, and her interest in moving to Daphne and Blaze's company to help them expand. Might get what you want. I'm cautiously optimistic. I expect nothing less. Hermione smiled. Show me how you would set this place up. Draco slipped his hand in hers and led the way. Like times before, she was drawn less to what he was saying and more to the undertones of excitement and the way he got awkward whenever he wasn't quite sure about something, or he changed his mind mid-sentence. Watching a stoic and pragmatic planner talk wistfully and dream was quickly becoming her favorite thing. It was like seeing Draco at his most vulnerable, and talkative. In fact, she was so focused on him that she didn't notice what she was doing until it was too late. She placed her hand on what appeared to be an empty shelf and cut herself on a large shard of stray glass. Pain shot through her hand as blood bloomed from the deep cut that stretched across her palm. Draco was quick, vanishing the glass stuck in her hand while Hermione healed the cut by clasping her hands together and whispering a healing charm as blood droplets hit the floor, one after the other. She felt her skin knit and heal under Draco's concerned gaze. The blood was easy to wash away with a spell and once her hand was dry, she told him they could continue, but Draco shook his head. Let's get out of here. November 18th, 2011 Perfect stillness reigned. When Hermione woke, moonlight was pouring into the room through the window. A quick glance at her clock showed her that dawn was at least an hour away. Draco was fast asleep, if his deep and even breathing was any way to judge. Carefully shifting so she was lying on her back, 
Hermione winced through each movement thanks to a familiar soreness from an exhaustive night of blurred pleasure and heady sensation. The world itself had been reduced to them, everything indistinct and vague as they gorged on each other while drifting in and out of sleep. Ever the student, Hermione made mental notes about the reactions he didn't know he'd had. Praise made his toes curl, and the act of reducing him to incoherent moans and shouts taught Hermione something new about herself. She really was power-hungry, at least for the power found in making him lose control. It was intoxicating, exhilarating, liberating, and just thinking about it in the early morning made her tingle. Wide awake, yet too tired to do anything about it, Hermione decided to relax and allow herself to sneak more than glances at him. Draco was all messy hair and pale skin, with smudges of light bruises made by her fingers and mouth and teeth. While dozing in and out of sleep, she traced the parts of his tattoo that she could reach until sunrise gave her the energy needed to pull herself from bed. Hermione soaked in the clawfoot tub. The water was just shy of too warm, bubbles tickling her chin, and she kept her eyes shut, breathing in the scent of eucalyptus and mint that soothed her muscles. She bathed and relaxed body tingling, reluctant to leave the warmth until hunger drew her out. Wrapped in a towel, Hermione brushed her teeth while noting the second one next to hers. She arranged her hair into another bun and smirked at the marks on her thighs and the ones she knew were hidden underneath the bath towel. They might have overdone it a bit, but she had no regrets or complaints. There was a knock on the door. Come in. Draco peeked his head in first, then entered, wearing nothing except black briefs he'd likely picked up from where she tossed them on the bedroom floor last night. It was shockingly easy to lift up on the tips of her toes and press a quick kiss to his cheek, easier still to remind him where the towels were in order to shower, sharing her space. Breakfast? She asked the question once she was back on her soles. Eggs over easy aren't hard to do one-handed. I'll shower first, then come down and make tea. Draco stole another kiss. And then... He ran a finger along the top of the towel. I'm sure you have some chores and the chicks to tend to. Longbottom will be in the greenhouse at some point. Perhaps before we pick up Scorpius, I could take you somewhere. Oh? You once told me to take you to my favorite place. Of course. Hermione wrapped her arms around him, without questioning how easy it all was, and allowed herself to enjoy it. Draco pressed his lips to her forehead. Maybe we could talk about all this there. He chuckled, mouth still on her skin. About? Boundaries and everything. Because I'm me, and I want us to be on the same page about as much as possible. I think we're both going to take time getting used to making decisions together. And I'm sure we're going to mess up, of course. But there are some things we should consider first. Hermione could almost feel the judgment wafting off him when he rested his chin on top of her head. If you want more time, that's fine. We can. We can still have an indulgent day. We deserve it. I doubt either of us knows how to properly indulge. I'm willing to try. A pause. So am I. Hermione left him to shower, and changed into something comfortable before venturing downstairs, ravenous with breakfast in mind, only to find Ginny in her kitchen at the stove. It smelled like a fry-up. Oh, no. Morning, sunshine. Breakfast is done. Harry's being tormented by the kids, and I thought you might like a bit of company. At Hermione's raised eyebrow, Ginny came clean. Okay, I'm here to check on you. You weren't home when I came by yesterday afternoon. Yes, she was, but apparently neither of them had heard the flu. Um, she folded her arms. I'm just fine. You can... Padma told me you were upset about something, but I couldn't squeeze details out of her. And also, I know things between you and Draco haven't been resolved, so I'm here to lend an ear. I'd make mimosas, but you can't drink. A pity, really. Though I could probably have a couple for myself in your honor. You see, about that, I... Oh, don't be stubborn! Ginny's brown eyes turned dangerous. Accept my fry-up and tell me if you want your bacon fried, crispy, or chewy. I made all three options. Then we'll eat and you can tell me all about your feelings about... The pipes groaned as the water turned on upstairs. Hermione and Ginny turned towards the sound, then back to each other. Her world slowed on its axis as her friend seemed to cycle between confusion, shock, and surprise, before settling on a leer that made her look positively maniacal. Bloody? No. Fucking? 
Ginny, Merlin, stop. Hermione ran around the island and jumped on her back to silence Ginny before she shrieked. In a dignified manner, of course. Only Ginny wasn't budging. They were roughly the same height, but the redhead wouldn't be taken down, resisting when Hermione covered her mouth. Ginny all but carried her on her back towards the sitting area. The fact that she was able to turn off the cooker and move the pan over with ease was just offensive. It was an easy reminder that she had three children, was in an excellent Quidditch playing shape, and couldn't be tamed. Ginny dropped her on the cushion and sat next to her, laughing while Hermione sulked. Do we have to discuss this now? Ginny's lifted eyebrow answered the question. The shower was still going. Fine, Hermione huffed. Quickly. I don't know how long he'll be there. So Malfoy is upstairs taking a shower because he spent the night. She didn't bring up the previous day at all. It would only initiate more discussion. I'm supposed to be making over easy eggs down here before he comes to make tea. Oh, lucky guess then. Do you need to leave right now? Yes. Ginny caught hold of the urgency in her tone, smile widening. She clearly had been spending too much time with Pansy. You two worked it out. Long story short, we had a row and he apologized with an olive tree from the manor's greenhouse. That's practical. Oddly sentimental and incredibly romantic. I have questions. I don't have answers. Fair. Ginny touched her chin. Also, thank fuck it happened before next weekend. Everyone owes Luna and I money. They both paused to listen for the water. It was still on. In fairness, I had insider information from your first shag, and I've learned since Halia not to bet against Luna, but no one needs to know that. You really have been spending too much time with Pansy. Also, you're all horrid for betting on us. Please. Betting was the only way to stop Pansy from yelling at you. She did that already. Loudly. There were tears and arguing and later apologies. I did my best. So, how was your night? You look shagged out but bright-eyed. Good one, then. Ginny looked at her closer, her face transforming into a beacon of pride. More than two? Good for you. You also have a bruise, right? Hermione slapped a hand over her neck, where she knew Draco's teeth had made an impression at some point. Several points, actually. Kidding, Ginny practically cackled. Just wanted some questions answered and things confirmed. They're too easy. Get out. Fine, fine. She stood up and Hermione followed her to the flue. Take your potions. Enjoy your morning and my breakfast. You mean our day until we pick up Scorpius? Ginny looked supremely impressed. We intend to. When she left, Hermione blocked her flu, then for good measure blocked the one in her office before looking at the meal Ginny had left behind. By the time Draco came downstairs wearing joggers and a shirt with bare feet and glasses, breakfast was already plated. He tilted his head to the side, knowing she hadn't made everything herself. Ginny stopped by to make cheer-me-up breakfast, only to realize I'm quite cheery. Does she... Yes... Draco looked away as he brought his thumb to his lips in what looked like an attempt to cover his smirk. It didn't work. She privately wondered if her growing ease with them was seeping through his cracks. Time would tell. He went about making tea while Hermione tended to the chicks. She washed her hands before they ate in near silence broken by the sound of happy little chirps. It was comfortable, but not nearly as nice as lying on the chaise with him after. Lazily reading a book while Draco rested his head on her chest, and she absently combed her fingers through his hair. For the better part of an hour, while the sun climbed higher in the sky and the clouds rolled in, he dozed. And so did she. It was unsurprising how tired she was. Draco was a tangible weight that felt secure, and her eyes were heavy. Sleep made sense. The next time she woke, Hermione had no idea what time it was, but she did know she was alone. Turning her head in preparation to sit up, she spotted Draco watering one of the more thirsty plants. He picked up one of his son's rehab succulents and squinted at the name, and watering directions written on the side of the pot before placing it back where it belonged. Rather than interrupt, Hermione watched as he moved to the floating brooder. She had just enough time to wonder what Draco was doing before he reached in and retrieved a baby chick. The sight was unexpectedly attractive. Even when Draco frowned at the chick— especially then. A traditional pet. There was a pause before he glanced over his shoulder. Isn't that what you suggested? How did you know I was awake? Hermione said up fully. You stopped snoring. 
Was that a joke? His following smirk indicated yes. Hermione rolled her eyes, a chuckle escaping her. After pulling herself off the chaise, she joined Draco with the chicks, picking up a second one while he scooped the last. The first one was settled in his palm, chirping happily. I think they like you. She couldn't help but smile. Their chirping woke me. They're happy, soft and warm, too. Not terrible, right? Draco gave her a look. Do you think I could buy him a pet for penance? Four? Hermione proceeded to pet the chick settled in her hand. I'm still apologizing. When she made a small noise, he shifted both into one hand. You have thoughts. Always, but I'd hold off on a penance pet. One by one, Hermione returned the chicks to their brooder, and soon they were huddled together. What did he say to you? His word. Mine was high. He just called me dad. Draco seemed to reflect on his answer as the corner of his lip twitched so quickly and she barely noticed it, before it evened into something inexplicable. Warm and proud, yet humble. He didn't take the title lightly. She wondered how long it had been since he'd heard the word from his son. If he ever had at all. What time is it? He changed the subject, and she allowed it, feeling a familiar pull of emotions tug on her heart. After two. Draco stepped closer. Lunch, potions, and we can go. Have you been cleared to apparate? I was last week. Hermione shuffled from foot to foot. But I'm not ready to do it alone. Not yet, at least. They had Vietnamese for lunch in a restaurant on the other side of the city, and after they left, Hermione didn't untangle her arm from his, not even as they joined the walking path filled with others enjoying the dry day. They ambled slowly, the silence sporadic, taking in the sights all around them. After a particularly long stretch, Draco led them off the path to an apparition point. It wasn't the first time Draco offered his arm, and trust came as easy as him waiting until she was ready before extracting his wand. The pull left Hermione nauseated, disoriented from the violent memory, but they landed smoothly, even if she didn't let go or pry her eyes open until certain smells and sounds smothered in the memories. Pine and crisp air. Birds and lapping water. They were on the shores of an island, ringed by a lake and surrounded by a dense forest. It was sunny but brisk, and the irony of Draco's favorite place being one marked in solitude wasn't lost on her and neither was the tent sitting in the middle of the wilderness. It's beautiful. Hermione did one full revolution. Do you come here often? No. Then how do you know it's your favorite place? Get in, Granger. He gestured to the tent. I know you're wondering. Why go into nature and then block it out with a tent? Hermione gave him a look before complying. Of course I'm wondering about that. And then she understood. The tent was charmed to look mundane, but looks could be deceiving. Draco put down blankets, and they sat in the center, looking around at untouched nature from the warmth of their shelter. It reminded her of sitting in her conservatory, watching the world just beyond the charmed tent walls. They watched the water, the sky, and everything in between. Hermione leaned against him in silence, her hand on his thigh. "'You brought me here to talk, but—' Hermione trailed off, distracted by nature. I'll be brief when I say I'm not interested in us being public news quickly. I agree. Friends and family first. My mother knows, but given your discussion with her, I'm assuming you told her. <laughs> she already knew, she chuckled. I don't think we're as subtle as we think. Draco laid back and she joined him, eyes on the partly cloudy sky. I don't believe in involving others in my relationships, Hermione said after a long silence. Harry knew more about my problems with Ron than I did. Everyone was involved in our fights, but I'm a private person, and I prefer to keep our issues between us and sort through them ourselves. I think we've been direct enough with each other to not drag everyone in when we disagree. Fair. Beyond that, we'll cross that bridge. Ginny already knows, so I imagine Harry will soon. Draco made a face. Harry already had an idea, and I'm under the impression he didn't get it from me. Perhaps I asked him about you once or twice. Draco sighed and turned his head, just in time to catch her disbelieving glare. 
Potter's not half the friend you think he is. He doesn't even know your favorite flower. I don't have one, she laughed. I like anything useful, which is why I'll be looking up how to cure olives to make oil. Perhaps a trip to the library is in order. Hermione smiled. I doubt that particular library has books on olive oil making, but they do have some books on you don't have a time limit. You're free to go there as you wish, with or without me. Thank you. She said it anyway, even though she already knew. He'd given her access after all. And as she watched him, as she felt his thumb riding the highs and lows of her knuckles, she realized that in some ways Draco was like the tree he gave her. Olives grew where nothing else could. Resilient to fire and drought, the trees produced bitter fruit only edible through care, a process every bit worth the effort. My timing is terrible in all of this. I know what's coming up, and I'm not sure how to navigate it with you or Scorpius. I imagine it'll be a rough day all around. Truthfully, I was planning to wait until after it to talk to you, but Theo didn't think you should go into the day alone. He thought you... Well, he thought having someone might help. So I went to your office, and you weren't there. But the pictures were. I'm still sorry. About being a complete arse? I know. But I wasn't exactly communicative. I know I needed to make several changes, and I planned them out. I don't like saying I'll do something and not following through. My focus was singular, and I never thought about what it would look like to you. You both mean enough to me that a half arsed plan would never suffice. Draco looked away, and Hermione rested her head against him. "'It's been about more than you,' he inhaled and slowly let out the breath. "'Astoria's anniversary, and the fact that I worry about every step I take. I meant what I said. I want everything. But I'm also navigating what that entails. I still have my issues, my insecurities and fears of failure. We both do. Loving each other hasn't changed our situation overnight.' Admitting it won't change who we are, but doing both has been a leap of faith. At least we're navigating this together. She nudged him. So let's create a space and figure out what we need to put in it to thrive. Chuckling darkly, Draco turned his head towards her. You sound like Kingsley. I'm pretty certain that was him speaking through my subconscious, Hermione smiled. He's given me a lot of advice over the years, taught me about bees, and I've come from each conversation with an understanding about life, and lately, about you. Bees helped you understand me? In ways. Draco fell silent, and she held steady in it with him, feeling his thumb swipe over the grooves of her knuckles, twice over her ring finger, before she opened her hand to him, accepting his warmth. How about this? When we pick up Scorpius, let's pause in telling him until after. Catherine will be leaving later, so we'll spend a week or two at my house, just the three of us, get him used to the concept. It'll be a time for us to figure out what we want to do. Call it an experiment. Draco's smile slowly grew wider at the first signs of sunset reached above the trees. There was a time when you refused to do that. I suppose I finally saw something, or rather, I allowed myself to see something that inspired me to try. And that is you. The father. The son. The man. Scorpius packed his own bag. He left with it slung over his shoulder, and though Hermione had praised him for doing such a good job, she chuckled at its contents. Markers without coloring books or parchment. A blanket of hers he always kept close. His toothbrush. A baggie with the tooth he'd lost that morning. The clothing choices included snitch pajamas, five bow ties, and nothing else. Catherine peeked her head in. Need anything else before I leave? A spare bag for Scorpius's things. He packed himself. The two exchanged growing smirks. What did he leave behind? Everything. It didn't take long before Catherine had a bag with extendable charms on the bed, and they'd packed more than enough clothes for the time they would be staying at her home. Scorpius's wardrobe was larger than hers and mostly untouched, which made it easy to pick a suit for the day of remembrance. A coat for the cold days, socks and undergarments, a wide array of trousers, shirts, and comfortable jumpers in different colors, a variety of shoes, options for a little boy who was learning to make his own choices. 
Catherine folded each item and packed them with care while Hermione looked around for comforting things. She had just placed the projector inside the bag when the other witch finished folding the last piece of clothing. "'What time is your port key?' Hermione checked her watch. Thirty minutes. "'All packed?' "'I am. My parents are thrilled.' Catherine was going home to her family until the start of her new role, once Scorpius was enrolled in a new school. "'I haven't been home for this long since I finished school. It'll be nice to see everyone. I'm grateful for Mr. Malfoy's generosity.' Draco had given her a bonus large enough to make her cry. "'You've been working hard with the children, and it's much appreciated by everyone. You and Mr. Graves have helped things run smoothly.' The tutor's last lesson a few days ago was the first time Hermione had seen the elderly man smile. He was off to start his retirement on a vacation to Istanbul. Catherine shut the bag and gave her a curious look. "'Where will Scorpius spend his days while his father works?' "'At the burrow or with me.' "'He'll love it!' Catherine's smile turned shy. "'He... I'm not sure if you know this, but he's talking. At least to the others. Freely at that.' I happened upon them chatting, but he hid so he wouldn't be nervous or stop. Thank you for telling me, but yes, I know. He's beginning to talk to me and has spoken to his aunt and his father once. I... She stopped when the other witch gasped. Is everything all right? Yes, Catherine looked borderline tearful. I'm just really, really proud of him. Things were difficult when I started, and I didn't know if I would make it to the end of the year. And now he's like a completely different child. Not lonely or miserable. Not hiding. He has you and a closer relationship with his father. He has friends and interests. He smiles and laughs. He's going to school. I just... He has you, too. For all Hermione's earlier frustrations with Catherine, it was obvious how deeply she cared for Scorpius. How hard she tried, even if it wasn't always productive. But Catherine had learned and corrected behaviors. And for that, the young witch would always have Hermione's respect. She offered Catherine her hand. Come now, let me see you off. And they did just that in the backyard, but she wasn't alone. Scorpius was at her side. Be sure to flu call when you're settled. I packed a potion to help with portkey nausea. I will, thank you. Catherine adjusted her bag over her shoulder, careful not to drop the portkey Draco had given her, a white and gold Fabergé egg. I'll see you both in January. Hermione hugged her first, and Scorpius did the same before returning to her side. "'Safe travels. Thank you.' "'Bye,' whispered the boy shyly before burying his face in her side. His farewell stunned Catherine so much it took a few seconds for her to respond. "'Bye.' And then she was gone. Scorpius went to his father's office, while Hermione made sure to put mint with his two bags so it wouldn't be left behind. The glow of the runes on the pot meant the plant needed for nothing. Her walk to Draco's office stopped at the doorway, where she found both father and son staring at each other. "'One thing you want to do,' Draco signed as he spoke. Scorpius went through his normal range of indecisive looks, before something made him light up and take off running, stopping in front of her to ask where his bag was. Hermione signed that it was on the sofa, and off he went. "'Everything okay?' She massaged her sore hand. Yes, I promised that we could do one thing together tonight. His choice. Penance. Hermione gave it no thought, not even when Scorpius returned looking nervous and a bit mischievous but overall excited. Hours later, after dinner, they lounged in her lit conservatory, listening to Draco tell a rare story to Scorpius. Instead of constellations or history, he talked about Astoria. She excused herself to give them time alone, but Draco asked her to stay listen. Slowly, and with numerous breaks, he spoke of Astoria's imagination and love of creativity. How, when she was well enough, and even when she wasn't, she would listen to music at full volume, much to Narcissa's aggravation. How Daphne and Dean showed her that love was more powerful than hate. How war taught her that anything built on hatred would eventually be torn down by it. And she helped Draco understand the same. She forced him to learn about a world and the people he was biased against, and thinking for himself made him understand. And lastly, Draco told him about how simple things like fresh air, sunshine, and moments of rebellious independence helped the story live. He likes the sun. For several minutes after Draco finished, 
Scorpius oscillated between staring at his father, his hands, and the darkening skies beyond the glass. Hermione spent the same stretch of time deep in thought, full of emotions she was processing, only snapping back into focus when Scorpius got up and walked into the house. Neither knew what to think or what was going on in his head, but he returned with the bag he'd packed himself. Draco looked as perplexed as Hermione felt when he pulled out a wooden box. It had been there before, but perhaps it was the last thing he'd run off to obtain. What is it? And you? Scorpius signed shakily, cheeks flushed. It reminded Hermione of what she told Draco. He wants to know you. Scorpius opened the top and turned it over on the table. What looked like hundreds of folded scraps of parchment fell out of a box charmed to hold far more than its dimension suggested. It very well could have been each note Draco had written over the course of many, many months. The pieces of his father he'd been trying to fit together. To learn him to know him better. Read, Scorpius signed to his visibly stunned father. Please. Draco went to pick one up, but Scorpius stopped him, pulling one from his pocket. It looked more worn than the rest, as if he'd folded it and refolded it countless times. Cherished. With much hesitation, Scorpius offered the note with both hands. At first, Hermione thought he wouldn't let it go, but he did, slowly. Draco cleared his throat. "'You want me to read this one first? Scorpius nodded, cheeks flushing with a mix of nerves and excitement while watching his father open the parchment. He put on his glasses, skimmed the note, and looked on at his son standing patiently waiting to hear whatever it said. "'Why this one in per—' Draco stopped when Scorpius stepped closer, his blue eyes locked on him, insistent and vulnerable. While Hermione wasn't sure she was breathing— Draco appeared more nervous than she had ever seen him, but exchanged looks seemed to settle something in them both. He placed the note on the table and rested both hands on his son's shoulders, drew him closer. Familiar words of a father's devotion escaped him in a rush. Words he meant. Words Scorpius needed to hear straight from the source. You're the best choice I've ever made. November 21st, 2011 for the last hour, Draco stared at two different ensembles floating in front of him. He switched the ties and debated over wearing one at all. Vest or no vest? Did he want to wear the button-down with the traditional collar or one with no collar at all? The leather or dragon-hide shoes? Small differences in texture and cut aside, every piece was the exact same shade of black. But Hermione knew better than to say that. She only offered a response when her opinion was asked and watched his hands flex in brittle frustration— that prompted her to move from the bed to his side. This isn't about your clothes. Draco had been quiet and reflective during several points in the last couple of days, a cycle that likely started before their argument, given the hints and the talks they had had in the tent, but it became more evident when Scorpius asked her to help him make a gift for his mother. No doubt he had a lot on his mind, swaying on the pendulum between extremes. Happiness and grief— excitement and anxiety, doubt and strength, fluctuating by the hour, the minute, the second. Timing could be as bittersweet as grief was cyclical. Astoria hated black. The tie Draco had been debating on floated into his hand. She thought it was fitting for me, but also said I looked depressing. What color did she like? Peach, the color of the fringe on the carpet in my office. Draco pulled a face. It was hers. The one Hermione had called terribly unsightly on her first visit, but also the rug she'd spotted Scorpius sitting or lying on multiple times over the months, likely because it had been hers. A comfort. And because it didn't match a thing in Draco's office, Hermione quietly wondered if that had been the reason he'd put it there in the first place. It sounded like something the Draco who was unsure how to engage with his son would do. "'Is this your first visit since?' Hermione summoned the trousers and offered them to him. "'No, in May for her birthday. Then in July, when her headstone was set. I went alone both times. A decision borne by habit, not necessity. Her parents are doing a large memorial at sunset with their extended family. My mother will attend in my stead.' "'Why?' 
Astoria's relationship with them soured when they cut Daphne off after she begged them not to. It only worsened after they tried to talk her out of having Scorpius. They tried towards the end, but Astoria said she didn't need to fully mend that relationship to be at peace. Hermione looked down. She went through the motions of life and society as my wife whenever she was well enough, but I know she hated the attention that came along with being married to me. She wouldn't want the extra effort today. Then don't make any. It's customary to. This is about Astoria, not customs. Hermione picked a black button down. You have nothing to prove to anyone today. She was your wife, your best friend. Don't only honor her memory, honor her in whatever way you want. Draco said nothing while he placed each article of clothing on the bed. Will you stay? Of course. They spent the morning making use of Hermione's telly. Astoria liked films, and her favorite was old but in color. The Wizard of Oz. Scorpius watched while they dined on an arrangement of crepes Draco made with the sort of ease that only came from familiarity. Not at all breakfast food, but it was Astoria's favorite. The way Scorpius laughed at Scarecrow's entrance, paid close attention to the cowardly lion, and wasn't at all scared of the witch or the flying monkeys, told her this wasn't his first time seeing it. But it was Draco's. After helping Scorpius dress, father and son took a walk through the greenhouse while Hermione changed into something suitable for the day. The plan was to meet at Draco's and take one of their hired cars to the cemetery. When she came down to see Dean waiting for her, Hermione was perplexed, until he explained Draco had taken Scorpius back to the house ahead of her for one last thing and asked him to come through and wait on her. Hermione thought nothing of it until she stepped into the Malfoy's living room and was confronted with change. The walls were no longer bare. Four small scenic oil paintings hung side by side. Astoria's paintings. Likely chosen by the little boy looking at them from his place in his father's arms. Daphne was at his side, leaning on him. And when Draco wrapped a slow arm around her, Hermione heard her first whispered words. Beautiful just like the woman they were honoring, just like the blue skies and soft sun they were met with when they entered the cemetery at noon, just like the arrangement of flowers, bold against Draco's black attire, lysianthus for gratitude and appreciation, tulips for elegance and grace, yellow roses for friendship. For the second time that day, Draco stood with Daphne, his hand on her shoulder and hers on his back. An indeterminate amount of time later, he slowly kneeled in the grass and placed the bouquet on Astoria's grave. It joined the single red rose that had been there when they arrived. Theo, most likely. And then Daphne placed her contribution next to his. Red camellias. A flower sometimes laid on the graves of heroes. It spoke more than Daphne had all day. She touched the petal of the gladiolus that still stood tall and in full bloom, bowed her head, and walked farther into the cemetery towards the willow in the center. "'She needs a moment,' Dean whispered to Pansy, who no doubt was starting to move. Now alone, Drago looked back at them, and the signal prompted Hermione to give Scorpius an encouraging squeeze as she lowered herself to his level. Rosy cheeks, head covered and protected from the cold, and gloved hands. He looked around with trepidation. "'Are you scared of this place?' Scorpius shook his head, but leaned in until his forehead was touching hers. He took a few breaths before whispering, "'Do I look okay?' She caught Dean's shocked look in the corner of her eye. "'You look very handsome.' Hermione still fixed his bow tie, smoothed invisible wrinkles from his coat, and touched the flower pinned to his coat, and retied his shoes before sending him to join his father. She rose to her full height and felt Pansy's shaking hand slip into hers. Slow, wobbling steps paused each time Scorpius looked back to where she stood with Dean. For a moment, Scorpius seemed frozen between going forward and returning to her. But then Draco extended his hand. Trust brought him closer. The weight of his still kneeling father's hand holding his helped the little boy settle. They looked more alike than ever, both in black, fair blonde hair bright in the sunlight. Draco spoke to him. Low words he seemed to struggle with, but stopped when Scorpius stepped closer to trace the name carved in the headstone with one gloved hand. 
He seemed to be committing the letters to memory, with each turn of his fingertip. Arms wrapped around her middle to protect herself from the brittle cold. Hermione just watched the scene in front of her unfold. For all of Draco's quiet concerns, Scorpius was strong. Brave. It was hard to read Scorpius's emotions, with only his back and his father's reaction for clues. But his shoulders didn't tremble, and his fingers never left the stone. Judging from the shock that bloomed on his father's face, he spoke before pulling something from his pocket and placing it with his father's flowers, an envelope that gave nothing away. She only knew of the note written by him. Maybe he'd added a drawing of the past or the present or the future. Hermione couldn't be sure. The secret of the envelope's contents wasn't hers to know. It was for his mother. As were the pink carnation petals he'd pressed between folded pages of loose parchment, the white flower pinned to his coat was his next offering, a task that took so long Draco tried to help, but Scorpius managed without assistance. Next to the note and the petals, he placed it carefully. Then he was back at his father's side, leaned against him, staring at the headstone. Scorpius nodded once before Draco stood, took him by the hand, and led the way over to where Daphne stood under the tree. Only then did Pansy and Dean start to move. Hermione, too, but as she passed Astoria's grave, she slowed. Stopped. Pansy looked back when she released her hand. Just a minute. She felt the need to pay her respects. I... hi. Hermione felt strange talking to the grave of a woman she'd never known. But once the words were out, there was a feeling of peace. I've heard so much about you. She rested her hand on the headstone. There's so much I want to ask you. So much I want to know. So much I want to say. I've thought about it for days, but now I can only think to say thank you. For the lessons she taught Draco and the man she'd helped him become. For the life and the heart she gave to Scorpius. For all the lives she touched and molded and forever change. For the grace she had until the end. My heart hurts for all the things and people that you should be here for. The sacrifices you made the pain you endured. Her grief for the loss of a woman she never knew was complex. Without a story of sacrifices, Hermione's life would look very different right now. She lowered herself to her knees, pulled out her wand, and conjured a wreath of pink carnations. From one mother to another. I'm not perfect, and I still have so much to learn, but I will. I'll take care of them. Love them both, just as you wanted." She was like a gladiolus, forever in bloom, never forgotten. A gift Hermione didn't know the meaning of when given, but now understood with crystal clarity. Slowly, she rose to her feet and did a double-take at something in her peripheral, but saw nothing, blaming the moisture gathering along her lashes for the mistake. She joined Pansy, who waited far enough away to give her privacy. "'Everything okay?' Pansy asked when she looked around. "'Yes,' The rest of the afternoon passed slowly. The emotional windfall of the day settled on Scorpius shortly after they returned, and left him clinging to his father. The trip had taken every ounce of his energy. Draco carried him around the greenhouse, and they ate tangerines under the olive tree. When he finally got teary-eyed and broke down, he went from one embrace to the other until he settled against his father and fell asleep. Carefully, Draco changed his exhausted son into something comfortable. Worn out, he didn't rouse and Hermione left him to it. By the time she changed and tended to the chicks, she happened upon them both in their bed asleep, and Draco curled around his son as if shielding the parts of him he could. Hermione climbed into bed beside Draco and fell asleep protecting them both. There was no telling how much time passed when she heard the knocking. After checking on them both, okay with the fact that they were fast asleep, Hermione left for the source of the noise. Harry... He was pacing in front of the flue, dressed in aura robes with a panicked gleam in his eye. "'Harry, what is it?' "'Sorry,' he ran a hand through his messy hair. "'I know what today is, and I didn't want to come here with the news, but it couldn't wait. Where's Malfoy?' "'He and Scorpius are asleep,' a throat cleared from the top of the stairs, and then Draco descended. "'Potter?' he inquired once he was at her side. I don't know what happened. We're interviewing everyone and testing wands. Slow down, Harry. 
Hermione didn't like how frazzled he looked. What's happened? Cormac's gone. November 24th, 2011. Reality was sometimes an odd experience. Finding Narcissa and Andromeda sitting in the conservatory at sunrise was the strangest morning yet. They're still sleeping. Draco had gotten back late last night after a Cormac sighting led to a dead end. He'd found her and Scorpius asleep in the conservatory after stargazing. Ever so quiet, he carried his son upstairs and tucked him in with the ever-growing confidence that, as Scorpius had done each night before, he'd sleep through the night. When they were alone, Hermione made him eat, and they worked through some of the stranger details of Cormac's disappearance, beginning with how. One test had been negative for anything suspicious, which meant little, but it seemed as though he'd simply walked out during the change of shift. There was evidence he'd gone home, but from there, outside of a sighting in Gringotts, he was gone. It was well after midnight when Hermione sent him to shower, and she said nothing when he joined her in bed. Under the covers, they talked about anything else. Thoughts and residual feelings, mainly. But she held every thread of conversation until Draco dropped off. She fell asleep soon after. Hermione rose in the early hours and walked through the greenhouse, completing the chores she could before Neville and Luna arrived, mostly watering and monitoring for signs of growth from the newly awakened olive tree. She'd only returned to the house at the first signs of sunrise to attempt to make breakfast, and there she'd found the odd sight of two sisters waiting for her return. Still sleeping? How interesting! Narcissa rose to her feet slowly after Andromeda moved towards Hermione. I have never known Draco to sleep this late, not since he was a boy. Neither had she, but at least two of the last five days they'd been here, Draco had slept past sunrise. Scorpius, too. There appear to be chickens in here. Hermione couldn't see Narcissa's face, but knew she probably had a look of distaste. I promised Scorpius a while ago that I would get him a chicken of his own. It turned into three. I didn't want to separate them. Narcissa said nothing, only peered into their little home. The three were snuggled together. She had opinions, of course, but her eyes were as warm as the quirk of her smile. And Scorpius has been very much part of caring for them. A slightly raised eyebrow was all she received in response. I assume you both are staying for breakfast. Hermione accepted a hug from a smirking Andromeda. What is it? Nothing. She released her, and Hermione led the way back into the house. Do you need some help? Hermione didn't, but she let Andromeda assist anyway, while Narcissa sat on the stool and watched. The act was slower than usual. Cooking took longer. Cracking eggs was a task with her tremor, and her grip hadn't quite recovered, but she was determined. Day by day, she was still improving, and Andromeda never stepped in on her task, just completed her own. Scorpius came down first, still yawning and bleary-eyed. His hair pointed in all directions when he signed good morning, and much to their shock, he hugged everyone before wandering to the conservatory. Hermione had observed his morning routine before, greet mint and the other rehab plants before checking the chicks' food and water. Far more comfortable with Andromeda, she wasn't visibly shocked by the little boy's move, but Narcissa was. A casually affectionate hug was a huge step from hesitant handshakes and the occasional lean. Hermione smiled. Give him a bit. He's not really awake yet. Now a wide-eyed Scorpius reappeared, bumping into the doorway too quickly to have completed all his tasks. He started to sign, but kept stopping. The only words forming were apologies and broken signs she couldn't understand. Hey, there's nothing to be embarrassed about or sorry for, okay? So long as you want to give them, we all want your hugs. Hermione looked at Narcissa, who was blinking at her grandson until she cleared her throat pointedly. Right? Of, of course. For as much progress as they'd made, Narcissa still seemed to not know what to do. She still came off stilted, but she was trying, and that was what mattered. The two stared at each other before Scorpius nodded bashfully. Go on and finish, then wash up for breakfast and wake your dad. Still red in the face, Scorpius left, and then he was gone. The three exchanged looks. We're working on normalizing affection, so when he feels like he needs it, he won't only come to me. Hermione finished with Draco's over-easy eggs. Andromeda handled the meat. Narcissa waved her wand to send plates and cups into the conservatory to set the table. 
She heard movement upstairs and knew the difference between father and son. Draco would be down soon, but his appearance with Scorpius in one arm and his crossword puzzle in the other made Andromeda's eyes widen. "'Good morning, Draco.' "'Good morning.' He greeted his mother similarly before placing Scorpius on his feet and sending him into the conservatory. Andromeda followed, carrying two plates with the others hovering in front of her. Narcissa looked at them both, smirked, and followed her sister into the conservatory. To her, Draco's greeting wasn't vocal. His hands wrapped around her waist while she was sputtering the toast, or trying to. The tremors had stopped her. Draco gently plucked the knife from her hand, but she didn't move while he took over then placed it on the plate and turned her around slowly, pulling her against him. Hermione craned her neck as she wrapped both arms around his waist. "'Good morning.' Draco's kiss was a welcome response. "'How long have they been here?' "'They were here when I came in from the greenhouse.' "'Tea?' "'I left it for you to make.' "'Good.' She didn't tell him whatever flavor she had in mind, but he did cast a look over his shoulder before nodding in the direction of the conservatory. Go sit. Draco joined them at the table with tea for everyone and juice for Scorpius. Breakfast passed quickly with more conversation than expected. With Teddy returning home in a few weeks for Christmas, Andromeda was in a cleaning mode. Narcissa had an appointment with Charles at the house. Neville was coming over to test the stoil in the greenhouse, and Scorpius was set to be his companion with Luna. Susan would be by for therapy later on. Draco, despite last night's interlude, was technically on holiday for the next three days, which meant he would be harassing Harry off and on all day from her office. Scorpius was the first to leave the table, signing to excuse himself to change for the day. Draco signed back the same thing he did each day. Tomorrow? Yes. Andromeda waited until Scorpius was gone to ask her question. Have you told him? We did, yesterday morning. She and Draco exchanged looks. His reaction was on par with what I expected. Scorpius didn't have one. He'd thoughtfully looked between them, face cycling through an array of emotions, three of which looked like various degrees of confusion, before he shrugged and signed his only question. To her. Can I go play? And that was it. He'd spent the afternoon running around the burrow with the three Potter kids while she and Molly had tea. When she told Molly about Draco, she didn't look the least bit surprised. Molly had apparently considered it upon meeting Scorpius for the first time, but hadn't known the real possibility until the hospital. Her only lament was that she needed more yarn. Hermione chuckled at the thought of Draco wearing a Weasley jumper, but when Molly asked what color, she was quick to answer. Gray. The next hour passed with preparations. Andromeda went with Narcissa, but only after helping Hermione with the dishes. Scorpius dressed to work in coveralls, a long shirt, and garden boots, left for the greenhouse hand in hand with Luna, who was smiling at the sight she and Draco made on the sofa in the conservatory. "'Surprises are wonderful, aren't they, Scorpius?' Luna's dreamy voice left the little boy with a beaming smile before he followed her out. "'What was that about?' Draco asked once they were alone. "'No idea,' Hermione shrugged. "'Luna being Luna?' "'She has sight, you know,' he adjusted his glasses. "'Not fully manifested, I don't think. I still don't know what she was trying to tell me at Solstice.' "'What?' She randomly approached me and said something about there being a single choice between everything and nothing. Then she left. I thought nothing of it until Halloween, when she told me the moon wasn't truly alone. My aunt told me she suspected that Lovegood had a touch of sight. It made sense. Hermione thought of all the odd things she'd said to her with increasing frequency, and considered deconstructing her words to find meaning, but let it go. Whatever happened would reveal itself in time. Draco said nothing when she looked at his progress on the crossword puzzle, smirking only when Hermione purposely gave him an incorrect answer after he called her annoying. He didn't take the bait. Fourteen down is Cosmo, nine across is Havasu, and twenty-three across is Aikido, which means eighteen down can't be sign. If you know those answers already, why haven't you filled them in? I like to do them in order. And in pen! Hermione's horrified tone made him suppress his amused chuckle with a cough. "'Why do you do crosswords when you know all the answers?' "'It's good for the mind, apparently.' He glanced over at the spot where his mother once sat. "'Besides, I don't know all the answers. Multiple answers are common in crosswords and aren't always noted in clues. It's about knowing the possibilities and picking the best one.' 
she frowned. Crosswords are supposed to be reliable. Draco leaned in a little closer. Nothing wrong with an experiment. True. He had been the biggest one of all. As always, the arrival of Albus Potter was chaotic, and met with a quiet groan from Draco that turned sharp when she elbowed him in the ribs. He had the decency to not look as annoyed when the bright-eyed boy hopped to his side. "'I'm here, Mr. Draco!' Then he turned to Hermione. "'Hi, Aunt Hermione!' "'Hi, Albus. Where's your mom?' "'Here!' Ginny waved from the doorway. "'He was insistent on coming here today versus going to the burrow. "'Where's Scorp?' Albus looked around. "'In the greenhouse with Miss Luna and Mr. Neville.' Albus went into his bag, pulled out his goggles and gloves, and put them on. At least he tried to. Ginny helped him with the second glove. When he finished, he beamed proudly, missing teeth and all. But then, curious, goggled green eyes turned back to them. "'If you're Auntie Myony, can I call you Uncle Draco?' Every adult eye met. Foolishly, she hadn't considered the possibility of Scorpius telling Albus. Hermione folded her hands, one over the other. "'Well, Al, I—' "'I'd rather you didn't.' "'That's not a no!' If at all possible, Al's excitement intensified. Thanks, Uncle Draco! Bye, Mom! And then he was off, running out the door and towards the greenhouse, eager to reunite with his friend. Draco looked like he'd been forced to chew rocks. You had to know that was going to go like that. Ginny's humor was met with a glare. Hermione patted his shoulder. I'm off to work. Her friend's smile turned into a leer. You two, and actually, I'm off to the greenhouse, and Draco is going to flu call Potter. After Ginny left, they parted with a kiss and Hermione spent the next several hours with the boys, Neville and Luna, in the greenhouse. Neville showed them how to fertilize the soil, while Hermione explained how often it needed to be done. Luna just let them dig their gloved hands in the dirt and explore. Al's shirt was soiled in seconds and Scorpius made it worse by trying to wipe it off. The educational morning ended when Susan turned up for therapy. Draco appeared in the doorway, halfway through Hermione trying to hold her wand in the right hand for the first time since September, and he stayed as they talked through the plan going forward. "'How's your pain?' Susan asked. "'You're down to a quarter of your original dosage.' "'It's fine, mostly. Sometimes I get flares, but the numbness and tingling come and go.' "'Hand exercises twice a day with the putty,' she massaged Hermione's palm. "'Wear your brace whenever you're sore,' then glanced at Draco. "'Don't let her overdo it.' I've been good, actually. Both Susan and Draco blinked, but whatever was about to be said was interrupted by two boys loitering in the doorway with matching smiles aimed at their targets. Can we go to the playground? Albus asked. Scorp wants to swing. And so do you. Draco folded his arms. They both nodded sheepishly. Susan chuckled. We're finished for today. Why not? Hermione looked at Draco. There is a park near your house. We could take security if it'll make you feel more comfortable. He thought about it and was met with two pleading looks. Fine. Yay! The flu trip back to the Malfoy house and the walk to the playground were uneventful. Draco decided to leave security behind, but he wore his holster under his coat just in case. The cold day left the park relatively empty, which relaxed a paranoid Draco enough to stop looking over his shoulder every few minutes. They both pushed the boys on the swing set before leaving them to burn off all their excess energy. After casting a warming charm, Draco sat on the bench next to her and watched while Al showed Scorpius how to use each apparatus. Al spun the toy wheel and made a noise like a pirate. From the top of the playground, Scorpius's laughter rang out. A gloved hand slipped into hers as the trees swayed all around them. I didn't think he would play much. There was a faint disbelief in Draco's tone. He looks happy. Hermione would never stop marveling at Scorpius. They both do. After days of quiet moments and distant thoughts, so did he. Happiness wasn't permanent, but the taste of it today, and over the last few days, was sweet. Al used to be so lonely and misunderstood by other children. I'm glad they have each other. Draco made a quiet noise as the breeze began to pick up and the trees rustled in a dull, lazy rumble. He's not completely intolerable. What a compliment, Hermione nudged his arm. Tell the truth. You like him. I didn't say... Draco stopped suddenly, shielding his eyes from the wind while peering up at the moving clouds. They were gathering, rolling in faster than normal. 
Hermione wouldn't have thought about it, would have assumed it was a storm, but it was forecasted to be clear skies despite the cold breeze. Lightning clapped twice in quick succession. Thunder began to groan. Then roar. They were on their feet in seconds, wands drawn, looking for the threat while backing away from the bench. They saw nothing. A spike of adrenaline left Hermione jittery as heart hammered wildly in her chest. She heard Draco call for both boys over the growing wind, but their attention was elsewhere. One look and they both saw it for themselves. Clouds gathered to form a shape. A skull. Neither waited for the rest. Hermione turned to run towards them, half a step behind Draco for the second it took to cast an unbreakable charm over the audibly creaking playground set, but loud cracks stopped them in their tracks. Cold dread curled in her stomach like the knotted branches of the nearby willow when five figures appeared just beyond the edge of the playground. Three were cloaked. Two were familiar. One smiled, showing off his rotting teeth. "'Hello, nephew.' The past is a very determined ghost, haunting every chance it gets. Laura Miller, 1989-1990